Welcome back to The Real News Network, and reality asserts itself. We're continuing our series on how to get to a green economy with Bob Poland. And if you haven't watched part one, you should, because it will help you set up for this one. Thanks for joining us again, Bob. So one more time, Bob is a co-director and distinguished professor of economics at the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's recently done a big study called Global Green Growth, a forthcoming report with the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. And it's all about what we're talking about. Thanks. And I have US-based green growth done with the Center for American Progress. Right, Just so there's both that. reports, right? Yes. Okay. So in, in this one, we're going to talk about, we left the last one off, that there's a need for a green economy, and I think, I guess everybody kind of knows that, or most people do anyway. And Bob has done some specific modeling about how to get there. And, and if I understand correctly, it's about 1.5% of global GDP. Every year. Every year mm -hmm. invested in renewable and alternative energy and retrofitting and mitigating. Right. Um, and that's about one trillion dollars globally, about two hundred billion American. Right, roughly in that range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so what is a viable alternative, and what is a realistic path to stabilization? Well, you just said it. My my uh, my program is extremely simple. One and a half percent of GDP per year investing number one in energy efficiency. By far the cheapest, easiest way to reduce emissions is investing in energy efficiency. So what is that? Energy efficiency means that we, the buildings that we operate, that we live in, that we work in, are not going to waste a lot of energy. In okay, fact, I, I forgot to say in your biography, and I got to do this every time, uh, because we got to be transparent here. Bob has a company called Pair, which works on selling energy efficiency consulting and this and, sort of thing. And, and Yes, and renewable. Renewables. Yes. Okay, go yep. on. So, uh, uh, what is that? What is it? Yes, what I'm is gonna, energy efficiency? Uh, yeah. uh, buildings can all be, new buildings that are constructed should all be net zero. We can operate buildings such that it, if you um, insulate them decently and you design them well, use, n use natural shading and lighting to the maximum extent, and uh, utilize solar panels, if possible, geothermal energy. Um, sometimes it may be viable to have a uh, wind turbine in a neighborhood. Um, there's no need for any fossil fuels. I, uh, I'm telling you now, at, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Mass., which is a cold place, not particularly sunny, we're putting up, for, as part of my institute, we're putting up a net zero building now. In Germany, by 2050, there, the rule, the law is that every new building is going to be net zero. So the point here is right now, if a building isn't efficient, alternative energy isn't enough to, keep, to do the energy required by that building. But if you do all the things you're talking about, alternative energy would Absolutely. be enough. Now, there, uh, in terms of policy, the U.S. federal government in 2007, under President George W. Bush, signed the Energy Security, Energy Independence and Security Act, which mandates that 75% of all federal government buildings would have to achieve a 30% reduction in their energy consumption, raise energy efficiency by 30% as of 2015. Wonderful. And how many? 0.2% percent? of the buildings have, have done. done this. And so they're say, 75 percent and 0 0.2 have actually been yeah, done. Yeah. Now keep in mind. It's a law. Keep in mind that the, it's fully documented by the government itself. Even what's been done so far is saving taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars a year. The so 0 .2. why why aren't we implementing this law that obviously had a consensus with the Republicans and the Democrats? So why? I don't know why. Uh, inertia that yes, you have to put up. There are upfront costs. But as soon as you make the upfront costs in energy efficiency, you start saving immediately. Well, are we back to the power of the fossil fuel industry? I mean, they're going to sell less energy to government. They are. Uh, and I, I can't tell you what's it going on inside in Washington as to why this law isn't being implemented. But that would be the single best achievement in terms of uh, building a green economy would be to simply implement that law and then talking about state and local governments, to do the exact same thing, 
make all of their buildings energy efficient. And you're saying in the long term, the energy savings. Not will, even the long term, three years. In three years, it these pays things pays for itself. Pay, in yes, three in three years. years, it pays for. Well, then I mean, not every single building, but on average, it pay, they pay for themselves in three years. And this is true globally. I mean, McKinsey, the, the consulting firm, hardly, you know, Greenpeace here. McKinsey says that this is the single most important thing that should be done in developing countries uh, in order to save on energy costs. Well, this is, I mean, it's kind of scandalous. One, there's a law and a law that's not getting implemented. Right. So somebody's actually, so why, has, why hasn't anybody sued the government for not following their own law? I can't tell you that. I don't know why. And it seems a no-brainer that one would do, if it pays for, I mean, why aren't more private companies doing this if it if pays for itself in three years? Okay, so that is the big question. If it's so wonderful, you know, if there's $50 bills lying on the street, why aren't people picking them up? That's, yeah. the, you know, the way the economists are. Well, there are upfront costs, of course. You have to put up money, you have to invest in efficiency. And I mean, for uh, private companies, I can understand that might be an issue for government. That really isn't such a big issue, given the Fed can just say, go do it. The Fed can give us back. There, give there's, it back in three years. There's a budget, obviously, and then you know, then when when we're fighting over budgetary issues, then this one gets shunted aside. Now, it is true though that the Federal Reserve has the power to just lend the money. The Federal Reserve could lend the money to municipalities. Municipalities could set up their own agencies, and they could d make these retrofitting investments within their communities, and it would be a big source of job creation. And they could Something pay, pay we have, the Fed back based on this, the energy savings. That's right, which is uh, also another program that is you know, more or less in place, which enables people to borrow money to retrofit for their own residences and pay it back through their utility bills. Uh, these are the kinds of things that can be done in the area of efficiency in the, in the U.S., and globally. I mean, in India, for example, 30% of energy consumption is used for uh, residential cooking. And the methods are extremely inefficient. So just like put out cheap, efficient cooking uh, equipment, that would save low-income people lots of money. It would also be a dramatic source of, of emission well, reduction. Uh, do you, I don't know if you've looked at this, but uh, is there evidence that the fossil fuel industry is actively opposing such things? I mean, I know we, they, they generally do lots of PR against the whole idea that there is such a thing as climate change. We know they fight on certain legislative issues, but have, on retrofitting, which seems like even if you don't believe in climate change, just for the energy saving, one would think one would do it, even if you don't believe the science. But do we have evidence that's, like, what's blocking this? It's well, such a no-brainer. Well, I mean, you know, the, the, again, the, okay, so people, look, I, I could do it, and, and as you said, I'm a, I have my own business, and we try to convince people to do retrofits, and there are government incentives that we try to help people get all the incentives that would support their investment in retrofits. Why don't they do it anyway? Well, number one, uh, it's, you know, it's still, it's disruptive. You know, you have to, you have to have people, workers come to the building, you have to schedule it. Something could go wrong, so there are risks. I'm telling you on average, it's a payback in three years, but this, you know, your, your particular client might be the one where you don't get the th payback in three years. So we have to overcome these things. But if you're government yeah. at all the levels, right. One, you can. It's the, the the upfront money is not the same. If you know it's coming back, it's not hard to get the money. To On do average, it. of course, it's yeah. coming back. Yeah. yeah. So it's not that hard to find money when you can when you know it's coming back for a government. Number two, all this retrofitting is a whack of new jobs. So one, you That's would right. think from a government point of view. I mean, I personally would think it'd be better to do it through a public sector. But even if it, you know, you do it through private sector. This massive campaign to retrofit is all kinds of new jobs, and it doesn't need... Construction even... jobs, which has been flat on its back, yeah. And not massive new... Tra I mean, you could train people, but it's not like it's... No. You go have to go get a science degree to help learn That's how right. to be part of a retrofitting crew. Yeah. So, again, it, what, what's, what's the blockage here? This, we get back to politics again, of course. Uh, well, as I said, there, there are these issues. Now, is it because... Oil companies don't want people to retrofit their buildings. Um, I mean, logically, one could think that. I don't know that they're doing that. I, I know the power company here, BG&E, where we are in Baltimore, 
Um, if you can prove you've, you've, you're taking less electricity off the grid, there's subsidies, which I, I, I don't know for sure. I'm assuming these are passed through with some kind of federal money. Um, but There are subsidies, but they're not enough. They're limited, as we were talking about in the first segment. Um, for example, there, you know, in, in a lot of states, um, the, um, if you have a, you know, a solar system, a panel system in, in a building, and you, you know, can't, and you have excess uh, electricity generated. Can you sell it back to the grid? In a lot of states, you can't sell it back to the grid. Uh, in some cases, you can, but the price at which you sell it back is very low. So what you really need is very simple. You need to be able to sell back to the grid at a, at a market price so that people can make the money back from having made the investment. I, again, I know this very specifically myself for having been involved in solar installation projects. The degree of subsidy and the regulatory uh, arrangements in any given situation are decisive as to whether it's worth it for me as a, as a business person to proceed. So, you know, yes, the, the regulatory environment, the, the subsidies are not nearly adequate as long as we recognize that we've got to get to something like $200 billion a year. Right now, we're at about $50 billion, if you add up everything, about $50 billion a year in investments on clean energy. Private and public. Uh, combining private and public. So we need to- Do we know to the breakdown, the private-public split of that? Uh, no. But uh, that's roughly where we're at. And I would say that we, what we need to do is roughly 75% should probably be private, 25% public. Well, not we, if you're doing this massive government retrofit. If you start with, if you start there, no, of course, no. That and and by the way, if you do that, that would be a leading edge. That would that would advertise it. It would create new uh, companies that are ready to do it inexpensively. And it's also something that can be done at a city and state level. You don't have to wait for a federalized no federal every politics. school. Why, why isn't every school district doing this? Every school district in the country. I myself talked to some a, a school. I talked to some mayors in California about doing this. And we, we're still talking. Um, but meanwhile, you know, if we take climate science seriously, something big has to start happening, not in 15 years, in one year, two years. Okay, in the next segment of our interview, we're gonna talk about what's happening in other countries on this front and what can be learned from both positive and negative examples. Thanks for joining us. Thank so you. please join us for the continuation of our series with Bob Poland on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.